ITEC is a partner of the institutes, and so all of our public research, even some of our um, research that's specifically for partners, is available to high tech and the high tech family, which includes you all. But I wanted to start with an introduction to what is futures thinking. Um, and real quick, Institute for the Future (IFTF). We are a nonprofit based here in Palo Alto, California. Uh, we are originally a spinoff of Rand Corporation, and what we do is we help organizations combat short-termism. Increasingly so, there's been a, a lot of people who are so pressed with the immediate future. What's happening today, what's happening tomorrow, in a month or six months. And people, especially business leaders, organization, organizational leaders, are really failing to think more strategically about the long-term future. And so that's where we come in. We focus on what we call urgent futures, connective technologies, and just daily transformations to daily life. Um, we do this mostly in a 10-year time frame. Uh, people always ask, why 10 years? Well, 10 years is still close enough to feel relevant but it's also far enough out into the future where it gets us beyond normal people's planning horizons. Now, the most important thing here is that we produce what we call forecasts, not predictions. Um, and, and so um, anytime you talk to anyone at the Institute for the Future, they will tell you we are not in the business of predictions. We don't believe anyone can predict the future. Uh, but real quick, this is our offices in downtown Palo Alto. In a world where COVID is no longer a looming threat, um, you will be able to, to walk in and we have a public gallery, which we, we have available for folks to come in and uh, experience our research and come in and, and talk to us, talk to our researchers as we're thinking through about things in the future. So we're in downtown Palo Alto, uh, just a short walk away from Stanford University. Um, we've been around for 53 years now. As far as we can tell, we're the longest running futures think tank in the world. And in doing this, we've developed a lot of methodology, but also learned a lot of lessons. And I want to start by sharing the three big lessons that we've learned from futures thinking. And the first one, which I've already mentioned before, is no one can predict the future. Early on, um, we were in the business. IFTF was actually in the business of trying to uh, predict what the future looked like. We actually were the ones who developed the Delphi method and thinking through how do you take data and start to think about the likelihood of something happening. Um, but we've learned in 53 years that it's really difficult to accurately predict the future. And so if someone tells you that they can predict the future, you shouldn't believe them, especially if they're from California and especially if they're from Silicon Valley. Um, the rate of innovation, the rate of change, the rate at which technology is advancing and changing things today just happens so quickly. We see this all around us. That rate of change just continues to grow exponentially. And so it's increasingly difficult to accurately predict the future. Now, what you can do is you can learn to approach the uncertainty of the future in a systematic approach. And so what you do is you categorize the future into things that we know are going to happen and things that we feel could happen. And you turn that uncertainty insp into inspiration. And you use that inspiration to say, how do I build resilience today? How do I start to create an action plan and a roadmap today to get me to the future or to get me to avoid a future that I don't want to happen. So that's the first big lesson. Lesson number two is a rather simple one, but it's one that a lot of people take for granted and don't really think about. What most business leaders do today is what we call present forward thinking. They start in the now. What are the pressures of today? What are the goals that we need to, make, need to meet? What are the metrics that we're being measured against? Then you move on to what comes next. What do we need to do in the next quarter? What do we need to do by the end of the year? And then finally, if you're lucky and if you have time and resources, if there's time, you go on and you think about the long-term future, whatever that may be. For those of you who are used to operating under the horizon model, you're thinking horizon one, then horizon two, and finally to horizon three. 
Now, the big lesson that we've learned here is to simply flip the order, to do what we call future back thinking or back casting, back cast visioning. And essentially what this means is you start in the now where your pressures are, but then you jump out to the future and then you work backwards to what comes next. So in the horizon model, it's simply flipping the order, starting horizon one, jump out to horizon three, and then work backwards to horizon two. Now, although it may seem a little um, counterintuitive, uh, the secret is that the further out you go into the future, the more clear the future becomes. And that's simply because there's less noise. There's so much noise in the present. There's so many contradicting and conflicting uh, people and opinions and advice and official futures that exist out there. So the further out you go into the future, the less noise there is and the more clear there is about the future. And that is why we see the benefit of working in a future back mindset and a future back approach. Now, the third and final lesson um, that we've learned, and we struggle with this as professional futurists every single day, um, thinking about the future is inherently difficult. We know this, and there are four common traps or four reasons that make futures thinking difficult. And so what I wanna do now is walk you through those four traps and present some strategies that we've developed and that we use in order to help us be uh, more strategic and better at thinking about the future despite this challenge. Now, the, the first trap is that um, we have a bias towards precision metrics. And it turns out that the more precise the numbers are presented, the more we tend to uh, believe them, the more we tend to side with them. And so you will see here this image, you will remember um, the presidential election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Now, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you lie on or who it is that you actually voted for if you did, the numbers back then told a pretty clear story. The numbers, the, 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 the metrics that we were being presented with is that one candidate was clearly taking the lead. And so as we saw that, and as we got closer to the deadline of the election being called, a lot of people went in with a great deal of confidence, understanding that they knew the numbers, they knew how it was all going to play out and what the future for the next four years was going to be. Now, as most of you, if not all of you know, it ended up being the complete opposite. And even those people who voted for uh, Donald Trump were actually surprised at the outcome. And so our job is not just to rely solely on quantitative data, but also qualitative data, using these mixed methods to go out and find information that can inform our future forecasts, to make sure we're not simply blindsided or we're not being uh, attracted to just one part of the story. We're looking at a, at a more holistic story and taking a more wholesome approach here. Now, the second uh, trap that makes futures thinking difficult is the official futures that are all around us. Um, they are everywhere. And oftentimes, official futures are a good thing. An organization like high tech or the organizations that you all represent and come from need to have official futures. This is what guides your strategy. This is what guides uh, your operations into the future. But we tend to think of official futures as the most precise or the most authoritative, sometimes the only official vision of what the future could look like. And this here is one of my favorite examples. Um, this is the Forbes magazine uh, cover of uh, 2006. And it's, uh, it says, Nokia, 1 billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? So Forbes magazine has, with reason, been a long-standing voice of authority, a long-standing voice of official futures. And if you went in 2006 and you picked up the Nokia uh, corporate report, they were saying the same thing that Forbes was. They were saying, listen, 
our official stance, our official future is that we have the largest market share. We have the most customers. We have the most partners, the most money invested in this space. And so our, it is clear that our future is guaranteed. We are going to be the leaders in this space for a long future to come. Now, in retrospect, as many of you know, in the year, uh, just a year later in 2007, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. And so now when I show this example, people think, does Nokia even make cell phones anymore? Is Nokia even still around? Um, and, and so our job here is to challenge consensus forecasts to listen to these official futures, but not solely accept them as absolute truth and say, where can we provide alternative perspectives? Where can we provide alternative points of view that may contradict, that may support, or that may augment these official futures? Now, the third trap is uh, just a general human inclination to have anxiety about change. We see this all around us. And um, this was extremely exemplified during the COVID-19 pandemic, when it seems like we went from night and day, from doing certain things and practicing certain things to completely changing our habits and completely going in the opposite direction. So our job is to help people recognize those sources of personal and structural stress that may cloud our judgment in the future. Understanding what makes us anxious about the future, what makes us anxious about change, and how do we start to think through those and create strategies that may help us confront those fears and that stress in the future. Now, the fourth and final trap um, is that our future self is a stranger. Um, and, and what this means is that thinking about yourself in the future is thinking about a complete stranger. And this actually comes from research that was done. Uh, scientists took participants and they put them in fMRIs and they asked participants, tell me about yourself. Uh, what do you do for work? What are your goals? What are your ambitions? And as the participants started to talk about themselves, the medial prefrontal cortex, the front part of their brain would activate and it would light up on the fMRIs. Now the researchers said, I want you to talk to me about someone that you're familiar with. Talk to me about a spouse, talk to me about a child or a colleague or a coworker who you know rather intimately, a best friend. And as a person started giving details of, of, of someone who wasn't themselves, who they were uh, familiar with, the part of the brain would still light up. It would still activate, but not nearly as strongly. And so the researcher said, okay, I'm going to I'm going to show you a picture of a complete stranger and you tell me everything there is to know about this stranger. And interestingly enough, when participants were presented with a complete stranger, the medial prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain did not activate at all. And so the researchers said, well, that's interesting. When we're thinking about complete strangers, this part of the brain does not activate. So they went back and they said, listen, we're going to come back to talking about you. Talk about yourself. But now I want you to talk to me about yourself 10 years in the future, 20 years in the future, 50 years in the future. Where are you going to be living? What is your, going to be your job? Are you going to be retired? Um, you, you know, what is your investment portfolio going to look like? Um, how old are your kids going to be if you have kids, right? And interestingly enough, as the participants started thinking about themselves in a future state, <clears throat> the medial prefrontal cortex did not light up at all. And so what this told the researchers is that thinking about yourself in a future state is the equivalent of thinking about a complete stranger. And this at its core is why thinking about the future is so difficult for us. It's so hard for us because asking ourselves to think about ourselves in the future is the same thing as asking us to point to any random person in Times Square and asking us to give information about them. It's, it's a concept that's so foreign to us that is so difficult for our brains to, to grasp our, our, our thinking around. 
And so our job at the Institute for the Future is to, is to design processes that help us uh, pre-experience the future. So get people to imagine what living in the future could look like. And for this, I have two examples. Um, the first example is, you know, uh, you can come to someone and say, listen, the science shows that by 2050, uh, you know, uh, sea level, the sea level is going to rise by eight feet. Um, we can say that, and that's based on facts, that's based on numbers, we're talking about the future. Now, the way that I pre-experience this future for someone is to say, listen, by the year 2050, you're going to be 65. And by that time, the two airports that you fly out of, whenever you're going out of the state, whenever you're going on an airplane, the two airports that are closest to you are going to be underwater they're gonna be eight feet underwater because those are at sea level, right? And so um, what this means is that air travel is going to be a lot more complicated in the future. And so think about Christmas time, think about Thanksgiving, think about the holidays, and how are you going to get to your family if air travel is no longer a sure thing, if air travel is going to be something that's increasingly difficult in the future. So that's how we get people to pre-experience the future and place themselves into a future context to think about how they would react. Now, the second example here of how we get people to pre-experience the future, and this is um, my favorite example ever of, of someone pre-experiencing the future. Um, I showed uh, an image of our offices and we have a public gallery, as I mentioned, and oftentimes we'll hold workshops or convenings for different groups or just people come off the street to come in and look around. Now, the bathroom that is open or used to be open to the public um, has a sign on the back of the door so when you close the sign when you close the door excuse me there's a sign that says by using this toilet you are agreeing to have your waste collected and tested by the state and the county in which these offices are held and if the state or the county has any questions about uh, you know, the, the collection that you've dropped off, the waste sample that you've dropped off, we will use facial recognition technologies to track you and get in touch with you and ask you for further information. Now, we never tell anyone, anyone off the street, anyone coming into our offices that this sign is there. Um, and so normally what happens is people are in a rush to go to the bathroom and they close the door. And as they're halfway through their business, they see the sign and they read it. And this causes immediate shock, immediate fear, just immediate reactions of like, oh my goodness, where am I? What have I agreed to? How do I get out of this situation? Now, as you continue to read the sign at the very bottom, uh, in very fine print, um, the, the, the sign says, you know, this has been in accordance with a law that has been passed in the year 2050. And so this is what we call a future artifact. It's an artifact that could exist in the future, but doesn't quite exist. But as you go out and you see, there are things like smart toilets, there are things like facial recognition, there are things like data being collected at the state and county level in order to maintain the general public health. So it's not that far-fetched for us to imagine a world where this could be a possibility. And so our job here, in order to get people to react to the future, to have a visceral reaction to the future, is to place them into these experiences that allow them to say, wow, if when I'm confronted with this future, I'd rather think about what I do now rather than um, in the moment. So um, that's in, in essence what we do and um, how, how we think through uh, these four traps and these four challenges of the future. Now, really quick, before I, I open it up and get reactions from folks, just real quick, the basic understandings which uh, of futures thinking. Um, foresight is a practice, and the practice is a cycle. And so we've developed this, uh, what we call prepare foresight insight action. Um, for shorthand, foresight insight action cycle. Um, prepare is all about gathering your evidence, going out and looking for key pieces of evidence in the present that will inform 
inform what's going to happen in the future. This is where we think through um, what is the future's question that we need to be asking? What aspect of the future do I even care about and should I focus on? Prepare leads us into foresight. And foresight is where we're taking the answers to those questions. We're taking the evidence that we've gathered and we're building these robust stories of the future. Foresight is a plausible, internally consistent, provocative vision of what the future could look like. It's not a prediction, but it's one of many possible realities that could exist for the future. And again, it's all grounded on evidence that is happening in the present. We're not just jumping out to a random future and saying, imagine a world where we're pulling the threads on what exists around us to create these very compelling um, stories about what the future could be. Now the best foresight will lead to insight. And insight is really this moment of clarity, this aha moment where uh, you understand the future differently. You understand that the way in which you operate today is not going to be successful and is not going to be sustainable as you go out and you confront the changes of the future. Now, insights are very hard to come by. Insights aren't necessarily new ideas. Um, in With any given foresight, you would be lucky if you got one or two core insights from that. Um, so it's really important that you distinguish between new ideas, new innovations, new things that could emerge from what an actual insight is. And again, an insight is a new way of thinking, a new pattern of connection in your brain that allows you to understand that moving forward, you may need to change, you may need to alter the way in which you operate in order to be prepared for possible changes in the future. And finally, from insight, that leads to action. And a lot of us um, are, I'm assuming, are pretty good at the action phase, going out and saying, this is what we do next. This is what needs to happen next. This is where we align our goals. This is where we create a strategic roadmap. Um, now, oftentimes we get folks who jump into action without having done the foresight, without getting to the insight. And so again, using that future back thinking, that back casting that I talked about earlier is the best way to approach foresight inside action. And finally, once you've come to the end of the cycle, now the world around you has changed. There's new insights, there's new assumptions, there's new evidence out there, and you can start all over again and, and, and take a different approach, a different uh, thought about the future consideration for the future and go through the cycle all over again. Now, there are some key terms that I've mentioned here, and I just very quickly want to go into what these are. Um, forecasts and scenarios are that foresight piece. They're um, the actual stories, the actual visions of the future that we gather. But we use those by looking at drivers and forces of change and signals of change. So forecasts, like I said, are these stories about the future. They're not predictions. They're plausible. They're believable. They're provocative. And they're informed by evidence. Now, from forecasts, we can build out scenarios. And oftentimes, we do this. We say, here's a forecast for the future. Now, let's run it through four different types of scenarios, in a growth scenario, in a collapse scenario, in a constraint scenario, or a transformation scenario. And so scenarios just build off of those and bring more nuance and different dynamics to what the future could be. And the purpose here is, is, is to compare and control contrast those different futures and think through, are you prepared for one more than the other? Could you possibly be blindsided by one? Um, and, and, and how do you prepare to move forward? Now, the evidence that drives forward this, and this is very important here, there are two kinds of evidence, signals of change and drivers of change. Now, signals of change are very specific. They're small, local innovations that have yet to scale, but they have the potential to scale. These are very concrete observations that we see today that give us pause, that make us think, if the future were to operate in this format, the future would look radically differently. So signals of change can be a news story that you pick up. It can be a personal observation. It can be a data points. It can be a new prototype that your company is testing. But signals of change are very specific. 
they're local innovations that have yet to scale, that have the potential to scale. Now contrast that with drivers of change. And most of you may be familiar with drivers of change. These are also called mega trends, macro trends, macro forces. Um, these are long-term trends that we can extrapolate from with confidence. Drivers of change are things like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, aging populations, immigration, globalization. These are things that are broad and global. And we know are going to be things that we face in the future for sure. So when I talked about earlier, what we know to be true of the future, that comes from drivers of change. Now, what we think could be true of the future comes from the signals of change. And so it's, it's very critical that we differentiate and we think through both of those. Now, both of those pieces of evidence are used to create our future forecasts. Um, oftentimes for drivers of change, we use the steep methodology um, just to make sure we're, we're not just looking at technological drivers, but we're also looking at social, environmental, economic, and political. Um, drivers uh, happen at different uh, scales and at different speeds. And it's important to know that drivers don't happen in a vacuum. They all converge with each other and they're all informing each other. So depending on what future you're looking at and you're thinking about, it's important to uh, lay out what are the drivers of change and then say, what are the signals of change that could inform ways in which the future could be different or could be disrupted? Now, signals of change, I'm going to kind of double click on those um, as I come towards the end of my presentation here. Um, signals of change come from the William Gibson quote, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And so William Gibson is famous science fiction author um, and, and signals are this unevenly distributed future. It's the future that hasn't happened yet except for in small pockets. It's the future that has the potential to scale that if we play our cards right, we will scale into the future and that becomes the new normal. And so it's very important as futurists or as you think about the future to have a methodology and a process for collecting signals of change. At Institute for the Future, we have what we call future factors, um, which is specifically for our partners and for our staff to come in and collect different signals of change. So again, high tech is a part so you all have access to this platform. Um, you all have access to these signals of change. Again, these very real concrete local innovations that we're seeing around the world. And so our goal is to get all of the people in the IFTF ecosystem, our partners, our uh, folks who are in our networks to contribute signals of change that'll help inform where the future is headed. And so I, I, I want to pause here as I come to the end of, of, of my uh, presentation here, and I just want to share with you what I hope are some provocative signals of change. Um, I've gone out and I've collected about five or six that I've seen in the last three weeks. Um, and, and I just want you to think through these signals of change and what this means for the potential future. Now, to help you, here are some questions to ask yourself as you think through signals. And what I want to do is, as I share these provocative signals, I would love for all of you or some of you to just either put into chat or come off of mute and, and just give me your reactions to these signals and your, and your answers to these questions. So when you think about a signal, the first thing you want to ask yourself is, what kind of a change is it? In other words, what are we moving from and what are we moving towards? For example, we're moving, when we think about driverless cars, right? We're thinking about cars designed for human driving and we're moving towards cars designed for getting people from one place to another or cars designed for, you know, uh, multitasking along a journey. That could be an example of, but what are we moving from? What are we moving towards? 
The second question is, what would the world be like if this signal became common? If this signal, this small local innovation were to scale, what does the world look like? What does this mean for privacy? What does this mean for hiring? What does this mean for social interactions? What does this mean for the economy, right? Just ask yourself, if this small signal were to scale, what does the world look like in the future? And finally, uh, uh, it seems like a simple question, but is this a world where you want to live in? Is this a future where you are comfortable living in a world where you go to the Institute and you sit down to the toilet and we use facial recognition to track you and follow you and ask you for, for more waste samples, right? Think about, is that a future and what are the benefits and what are the drawbacks of living in that future? Um, so I'm going to start here and, and Omar, I'm going to pick on you and I'm going to actually ask you to, to kick us off here. Um, but I would love to hear from, from as many participants as we can. What are your reactions to the following signals? And so Omar, these are very real things. You can go out and find them. I promise I did not make them up. These are real things happening today. Um, but Omar, here's the first one. This is a company that has no CEO and where coworkers decide what each other's salary is. So go back to the questions. What kind of a change is it? If this change were uh, to become more common, what does the world look like? And then finally, is this a world where you wanna live in? Yeah, I, so Gabe, thank you. This has been a fascinating presentation. Uh, so thank you in advance for your time. Um, uh, this is a, a, a really, really interesting question. And, you know, I think for what we do at high tech, um, <laughs> very much a disruptive, you know, moving from a very traditional, very hierarchical organization into something, I mean, I think we already are moving into more flat organizations, um, but a less structured environment, obviously without a CEO and where everybody uh, decides each other's challenge, uh, salaries. I can imagine so many challenges in this, depending on the size of the organization, depending on what the organization does and how complex an organization is. But, you know, if I think of one thing um, that we focus on at high tech, which is leadership development, right? And, you know, for one, you have people who um, have spent maybe their entire career working their way up the corporate ladder. And this would obviously be very disruptive for somebody that has been on that path. But I think of people who would be really successful in this type of model, and it all comes down to leadership, which is what we um, are all about at high tech, right? And so I think if you have uh, individuals who are able to connect with and lead others and help people become their best uh, selves at work and at home, uh, if you have leaders who are able to empower others to move the organization, move the work forward, those are the people that I think are gonna be most successful. Um, and, you know, I think um, if this becomes common, um, I, I think people who are more diverse will end up being successful because they are going to be able to connect with um, and are going to be open to more ideas and more thoughts. And, you know, while I think personally this could be almost chaotic, um, I think it's something that I would surely welcome um, because you know, I think it, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about leadership. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to be the only one to respond here. So I uh, want to open it up to other people um, to weigh in. That's great, Omar. Thank you for that. Absolutely. You know, when we think of organizational leadership, you think CEO, you think C-suite, but this company has no CEO, right? So even our definition of what organizational leadership is starts to change in this kind of a future. That's great, wonderful. Anyone else have any reactions or comments or thoughts about this? I'm, I'm linking this to uh, a book I recently read actually by Bob Johansson, The New Leadership Literacies, um, in that he talks about these leaders at the edge and how, you know, 10 years, he wrote the book in 2017. So 10 years from now, so you're gonna have these leaders today that are gamers, pretty much deciding how the organization is run where these virtual teams, and it sounds like, oh yeah, we do virtual teams, but the way he describes it though, it, it, it's like leaders start popping up all over the place and, and they decide how the work is structured, how the work is distributed and how the compensation 
is reward is is doled out. So I'm kind of making that connection there. I mean, what kind of a change is it? It's pretty radical. I mean, it's pretty radical change. And I think that we're starting to see some of those signals and some of the organizations that are becoming very fluid, very virtual. And of course, the pandemic has probably accelerated some of that. So that's kind of my gut reaction to what you just said. Absolutely. Jose, thank you for that. And I will say quite candidly, Bob Johansson is not only my boss and my manager at the Institute, but my personal mentor. Um, uh, I okay. think- I joined the Institute three years ago, right after Bob had released the new leadership literacies and helped him with this latest book on full spectrum thinking. So everything I've learned about futures thinking comes from the brilliant mind of Bob Johansson. Yes, he, um, he is brilliant. He, he used to run the Institute um, and then yes. decided he, he wanted to continue doing research and doing what he loves to do, writing forecasts. And so um, now he's a distinguished fellow at the Institute and Bob has been around, my goodness, 47 of the 53 years that the Institute has been around. Yes. So yeah. um, truly um, a, a visionary in this space. Well, and real quick, I actually got to meet Bob. He would not remember me, by the way. Way back when, in in the 80s, he gave a talk to a group of about 10 of us at Procter & Gamble, because Procter & Gamble worked very closely, and maybe they still do. Uh, And frankly, I forget what the theme was, but I was just blown away by what he was telling and how consumer packaged goods was going to change. So anyway, thank you very much. Jose, thank you. I, I... I, I challenge that he may not remember you. I'm pretty sure he may. And Warren and Gustavo, thank you so much. Kristen, thank you for your comments in, in the chat here. Definitely will take some time to work. Um, you know, definitely a risk if you have people, you know, what if you get a company that's organized by people with bad ideas, right? And, and there's no CEO, no one. Who do you blame? Who do you go after, right? Who do, you, who do you call during a congressional hearing to ask about the ethics and, and the morality of what's been done? So great point. Second signal here. Um, some of you may have heard this one. One million dollars in federal dollars via a lottery to drive vaccination rates. This comes from uh, the state of Ohio, uh, which came out and said, listen, people aren't getting vaccinated. We need to get people the COVID vaccine. And so if you go and get the vaccine, you will be entered and there's something like five lotteries, each worth a million dollars. And just by getting at least one vaccine, you enter into um, this lottery with the potential to win up to a million dollars. So, you know, as we start to move into this future, what are you thinking uh, uh, about uh, the this this signal here. I think that we will see more organizations, not just the government, stepping into this type of thing because uh, there was a survey done that showed most citizens trust CEOs more than their government at this point. Yeah, and so. While I believe the intention behind this is to help what may be deemed underserved communities to overcome fears by trying to resolve their current situation, I I get it, I don't like it, but I get it. But I think from a corporate standpoint with a greater focus on environment, social governance, that you'll see something like, you know, hey, big gift over here with the future state of enacting greater social change, the future that they're striving for. Yeah, Kristen, that's a great point. Thank you so much. And that is a great way of taking one signal and pulling the thread and saying, listen, when this starts to scale, what does this mean? Not only for the federal government, but for state governments, for private corporations and incentives, right? What does incentivizing in the future uh, look like? A lot of folks are putting in the chat that Ohio was probably the first, but they're not the only ones, right? And so this is the benefit of scanning for signals, right? You start with one, And as you start to see more and more, you see that the marketplace, that our communities, our external environments are ready for this future, right? And so that can prompt you to think, wow, this future is much more likely to happen. We're much closer to this future than we ever were before, right? And so let me just pause here and say, when we find a signal of change, we're not saying that this is going to happen. It's not um, an assessment and saying, go out and invest in this. 
um, you know, what we're saying is this is a possibility. Now, most signals tend to fail, but they tend to fail in an interesting way. So just by identifying a signal, we're not calling out necessarily that it's something, um, something that is going to be for sure in the future. What we're saying is it causes us to pause and think differently about implications for the long term future. So thank you for that, Kristen. All right, let's see here. Um, CVS offering Super Bowl tickets, Delta offering a year of, of free flights. Great additions here, public incentives for public policy. Um, I'm loving this. Thank you guys so much for your interaction. All right, third one here. Um, and, and careful here, because I read that someone spit out their water. So this is your warning. It's gonna get a little more provocative from here. Um, the next signal of change, a study finds that 65% of all anti-vaccine conspiracy stories spreading on social media originate from just 12 people. I'm going to read that one more time. <laughs> study finds that 65% of all anti-vaccine conspiracy stories spreading on social media originate from just 12 people. I think one of those people is a neighbor of mine, just saying. <laughs> Pretty sure. Wouldn't that be interesting to be able to identify who, who that is? Um, it just comes to show that the world seems to be very small. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, mean, I don't see that, uh, I mean, would that be a change you think is happening is, or is already here? It seems like it's already, that is already here, that we've seen that everywhere that we go, not only on this subject, but anywhere. Gustavo, that's that's a great question and a and a great comment here. Definitely, this this um, being able to uh, follow disinformation and misinformation, especially on social media, is something that we're seeing more prevalent, right? But what what I find interesting here is that we're able to track the the, the origins, right? Go back into the traces, and the fact that this comes from just twelve people, right? What this tells me is that terrorism in the future could really transform and, and, and just be, you know, cyber terrorism is going to become a whole new ball game, right? Cyber terrorism, um, organizations, uh, small groups that are disgruntled, that, you know, um, feel like uh, they just want to lash out at someone, may, it may become easier for them to spread a false message, for them to gang up and really cause potential harm here. So um, I think you're, you're raising a great question here, right? How much of this is new and what truly is the future's angle on this? So, so thank you for that. Anyone else, any, any comments, any reactions? This makes me think about what it, what, how the future will hold for social media companies and what will legislation be to hold them responsible for misinformation like this, if that will happen and the ramifications of that. Absolutely, that's a great point, Antonio. And we've started to see some of that happening already, right? Where Twitter bans certain people, um, where if you're going on social media and it's uh, you, you read an article, a little pop-up will say, and it'll say, this has been known to come from misleading sources, right? Or uh, for more information on this topic, click on this link and go out and, and, and kind of um, look at that. It reminds me of those like warnings that you used to see before like the stunts and the prank shows like do not try this at home right now we're getting those for social media and what we're sharing um you know uh, imagine a world where you're about to post something and an ai or a bot comes up and says you're about to share something that's been proven to be wrong are you sure you want to continue right um what kind of a world what does that mean for for you know our rights and our freedom of speech and and all of that good stuff that makes america america Wonderful. I think I have about two more, two more of these, but let's see here. Uh, restaurants soon to offer cannabis infused foods on their menu as legalization spreads across America. So we're starting to see more and more um, restaurants pop up and industries kind of take on uh, cannabis as, as we're starting to see the legalization of weed and other, other kinds of things here.
Maybe this one isn't as provocative. Maybe, so, maybe so we, how many comments? Or maybe everybody agrees and nobody wants to <laughs> yeah. say it first. <laughs> well, well, since it's, since it's uh, gay, since it's illegal in North Carolina, I have no comment on it. But uh, I'm sure California is probably going to be the next big thing. <laughs> Warren, you'll have to fly out and come, come get a taste. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I had a CIO talking about their son the other day and how he grows the best weed ever. And I'm like, dude, what are you saying to me? But truly, no, his, his son has a cannabis farm and he's, and you're just like, wow. Okay. Yeah. And this welcome to the future. Here we are. Yeah, absolutely. But I, 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 as a recruiter who has to have people pass drug tests and corporations haven't all followed with, you know, the, the state policy may be you can smoke, but if you're going to run my back loader or my data center, I don't want you smoking. This terrifies me that you get Kung Pao chicken and all of a sudden you can't pass a drug test. Kristen, that's a great point. Talk about being met with um, unintended consequences in a future that we're, you know, potentially not ready for, right? Because you have to follow the rules. There's a very rigid line that says, um, but it's legal, right? You're able to go out and, and find it. And is that a pending lawsuit from an employee or someone, right? Um, what are the implications there? And how do you learn to safeguard yourself in your organization from, from something like that? That's a great point. I think there was someone who was going to make an, another comment. Yeah, I, I was just going to comment on this, um, you know, a couple of different things. It's so recreational uh, cannabis is legal in Illinois, so it's everywhere, and this is no surprise. Um, it, this isn't a surprise to me. I have a friend who owns a cannabis company, and she is doing cannabis-infused beverages, sparkling waters with, you know, weed in it. Um, and but but what I think uh, we see, and what I hope we'll see, is um, some sort of federal regulation that sort of uh, levels the playing field from state to state, because. Um, you know, to your point, it might be legal in one place and not in another, or depending on, you know, if you're looking for a job. Um, I had uh, somebody that, that I know who was detained in the U.S. Virgin Islands as she was returning back to the United States because she had, you know, something with um, CBD or CDB uh, oil in it. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I hope that there at some point in the near future is some federal regulations to to really kind of levelize everything. Yeah. Oh, Gabe, I have mixed feelings about this one because to me is a personal option. You make choices every day. You make choices if you are going to drink or not. You make choices if you are going to drive or not. So to me, honestly, and maybe I'm too liberal here, but to me, this is the person, it's a person choice and they will deal with the consequences of what they are choosing. So to answer Kristen, if they, they enter this arena and they know they can lose their job, it's as simple as that, it's a person choice. To me, the one about incentivizing the vaccine, I think that to me is more relevant because I, I think we are, we are teaching people you only do the right thing if you have an incentive. Yeah. So that to me is fundamentally wrong. Um, not that I don't like the lottery. I, I wish I could win 5 million, but it's the incentivizing. You only do the right thing, not because it's the right thing, but because you are going to get something in return. To me, that fundamentally is wrong. While yeah. this one is each one's choice. I you are free to choose whatever you want, but you are also free to deal with the consequences. Definitely begs some some of those um, <laughs> some of those hard questions, some of those very very difficult questions. Thank you for that. Um, all right, final one here. Um, Ethereum founder donates one point five billion dollar in meme coins to India COVID relief, and then the currency plunges. 
and becomes too risky to spend on belief. So this young man who is the founder of Ethereum donates $1.5 billion in, in a certain cryptocurrency to support COVID relief in India. And as he did that, the, current, the, the currency um, took a plunge and it started becoming less valuable. And so it became too risky for uh, the Indian officials to use it for COVID relief. Hey, this is Marisela. One of the things about Ethereum or just the digital currency, right, is that it's not just the currency. There's this whole platform behind Ether and Ethereum on which people are building these distributed organizations. And so for me, outside of the digital currency, the bigger trend here is these distributed organizations. I think they're called DAOs, mm -hmm. um, which would enable to some extent, I mean, I think this is how we're thinking about it, uh, bringing down more central organizations and making them less relevant. So will digital currency succeed in the future? I think it's kind of based on how successful the platforms are on enabling the exchange of the currency. But it, for me, like it no doubt has value. And it is sometimes being said to be like the third, like, the next big disruption online or the internet. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Thank you, Marisela. It it really makes me question um, the uh, the future of philanthropy, right? As cryptocurrency really takes over and it becomes more and more common. If it's so volatile, right? Imagine people trying to do good and a bad actor. We saw the signal earlier, right? A group of 12 decides to spread misinformation, causes the cryptocurrency to plunge, and now we can't provide aid, right? That's a very real scenario. It's a plausible scenario. We can see how we could get there in five to 10 years, right? And imagine bad actors just coming in and saying, no, screw India. We don't care about India. You know, we, we don't want money going there. And they're using misinformation to cause a plunge. And, you know, what do we do in this world, right? As individual philanthropists, as organizations, as governments start to rely more and more on cryptocurrency, right? Is this a future where we may need to regulate more heavily this industry? Um, you know, we may need to step in and say, we need to better understand how this works and how can we create these safeguards and, and, and these safe moving forward. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. That is